In the vast expanse of Christian theological discourse, the Epistle to the Romans stands as a monumental proof to the Apostle Paul's theological acumen and pastoral heart. Within this magisterial letter, Romans chapter 11 serves as a pivotal juncture, weaving together the threads of God's sovereignty, grace, and the intricate drapery of salvation history. The context of Romans, emerging from Paul's missionary journeys, reflects a fervent attempt to address the multifaceted ecclesiastical and theological challenges that beset the early Christian community in Rome. This community, a microcosm of the broader Christian church, was grappling with questions of identity, belonging, and the nature of salvation itself, especially in relation to the Jewish roots of the Christian faith and the burgeoning inclusion of Gentiles. Paul's dialogue in Romans 11 is particularly significant in this regard, as it seeks to reconcile the apparent tension between God's unwavering faithfulness to Israel and the radical inclusion of Gentiles within the ambit of divine grace. The chapter exists as a tribute to the depth of God's mercy and the unfathomable wisdom underlying his salvific plan, a plan that encompasses both judgment and blessing, hardening and redemption. By engaging with Old Testament quotations and employing a sophisticated rhetorical strategy, Paul endeavors to elucidate the mystery of Israel's partial hardening and the consequential salvation of the Gentiles, all while looking forward to the eventual full inclusion of Israel in God's redemptive embrace. This essay aims to explore Romans chapter 11 through a comprehensive lens, drawing out the theological nuances and pastoral implications of Paul's argument. At its center, this analysis will contend with the enduring question of how divine sovereignty intersects with human history and how the narrative of Israel and the Gentiles unfolds within the grandeur of God's salvific drama. Through this investigation, we seek not only to understand the theological underpinnings of Paul's message, but also to discern its relevance for the contemporary church, as it navigates the complexities of faith, character, and unity in an ever-diversifying world. First of all, the theological and literary structure of Romans chapter 11 is a masterful exposition by the Apostle Paul, complicatedly designed to cross the complicated theological landscape concerning God's relationship with Israel and the inclusion of Gentiles into the covenant community. At its core, this chapter is a profound survey of the bottoms of God's wisdom and sovereignty in salvation history, meticulously structured to show the revealing mystery of divine grace and judgment. Paul's argumentative strategy is both subtle and compelling, employing a blend of rhetorical questions, scriptural references, and metaphors to interconnect his audience, both Jewish and Gentile believers in Rome, and to advance his theological dissertation on the remnant of Israel, the hardening of part of Israel, and the eventual salvation that includes all peoples. The chapter begins with Paul addressing a potential confusion that could arise from his preceding discussion. The notion that God has rejected his people, Israel. By invoking his own Jewish heritage, Paul sets the stage for a delicate case that, far from rejecting Israel, God has preserved a faithful remnant, chosen by grace. This introduces the first major theme of the chapter, the election of a remnant, emphasizing the principle that God's saving grace is not contingent upon human merit or lineage, but is a manifestation of his sovereign choice. This section is not merely a theological assertion, but aids as a pastoral reassurance to his readers, affirming the continuity of God's covenant faithfulness across the ages. As Paul delves deeper into the account of Israel's hardening, his rhetorical prowess is evident. He crafts a description that portrays this hardening not as an end in itself, but as a divine strategy to facilitate the salvation of the Gentiles, thereby magnifying the riches of God's grace. Through the use of scriptural quotations, Paul anchors his claim in the Jewish prophetic tradition, legitimizing his message in the eyes of his Jewish audience and illustrating the extent of God's redemptive plan. The literary device of the olive tree metaphor further broadens this communication, symbolizing the convoluted relationship between Israel and the Gentiles. Through this metaphor, Paul conveys great truths about inclusion, warning against arrogance, and demonstrating the dynamics of kindness and severity in God's dealings with humanity. This metaphor helps as a vivid exemplification of the interconnectedness of God's people, accentuating the unity and diversity within the covenant community. Central to the theological and literary structure of Romans 11 is the revelation of the mystery of God's mercy, Paul's declaration that all Israel will be saved. 
This section represents the climax of Paul's contention, braiding together themes of mercy, covenant faithfulness, and the universality of salvation. Paul's doxological response to this mystery affirms the chapter's theological intensity, moving from debate to adoration. The doxology supplies not slightly as an ending, but as a theological affirmation of the inscrutable ways of God, encapsulating the awe and wonder that permeate Paul's thought on the divine detail. Paul's rhetorical strategy in Romans 11 is not only to address the immediate concerns of his Roman audience, but also to articulate a theological vision that transcends the specific historical context. His use of Old Testament scriptures, rhetorical questions, and metaphors functions not hardly as literary devices, but as conduits for theological truth, aiming to evoke a response of faith and obedience among his readers. The chapter's structure, marked by a movement from questioning to affirmation, from analysis to doxology, choose Paul's pastoral intent to guide his readers through the intricacies of God's salvific plan, encouraging them to accept a posture of humility and trust in the face of divine mystery. In summary, the theological and literary structure of Romans chapter 11 holds as a testimonial to Paul's skill as a theologian and a rhetorician. Through a sophisticated interplay of themes, discussions, and literary forms, Paul crafts a chapter that not only addresses the theological dilemmas of his day, but also speaks with lasting pertinence to the church throughout the ages. It is a chapter that confronts, comforts, and compels, inviting readers to marvel at the depths of God's wisdom and grace in the grand history of redemption. Also, in Romans chapter 11, verses 1 through 6, the Apostle Paul addresses a critical question that appears naturally from his preceding conversation. Has God completely cast away his people, Israel? Such a query is not only rhetorical, but strikes at the core of divine fidelity and the nature of God's covenant relationship with Israel. Paul, identifying himself as an Israelite and a descendant of Abraham, immediately nullifies the notion of total rejection by presenting himself as living proof of a remnant chosen by grace. This segment of Paul's epistle elaborately careens theological bottom with personal testimony. As Paul seeks to unveil the mystery of divine election amidst Israel's apparent fall, the doctrine of the remnant, as Paul elucidates, is not a reactionary measure by God but a sovereign and grace-filled continuation of his dealings with Israel. Drawing upon the historical precedent of Elijah's despair in 1 Kings 19, where Elijah laments the apostasy of Israel, Paul draws a parallel to his contemporary situation. Just as God uncovered to Elijah that he had maintained 7,000 who had not bowed to Baal, Paul asserts that similarly, a remnant has been chosen by grace in his own time. This remnant is not chosen based on works or ethnic lineage, which would nullify grace, but solely by God's gracious and sovereign choice. This central section highlights a serious theological principle. Divine election is implanted in grace, rather than human merit or effort, indicating the unmerited nature of God's favor. Paul's exchange here is both pastoral and polemical. He anticipates the objections of both Jewish and Gentile readers who might misinterpret the nature of God's promises as failing or being retracted. By invoking the concept of the remnant, Paul assures his readers of God's unchanging faithfulness to his covenant people, despite their widespread unbelief and disobedience. The election of the remnant delivers as a beacon of hope, clarifying that God's redemptive plan is unstoppable and his promises irrevocable. This remnant, chosen and kept by grace, lasts as an attestation to God's mercy and sovereignty, demonstrating that even in judgment, God's grace prevails, ensuring the continuation of his purposes for Israel. Moreover, Paul introduces a crucial distinction between works and grace. If election were based on works, grace would no longer be grace. This statement gives as a cornerstone of Pauline theology, maintaining the exclusivity of grace as the basis for divine election. The distinction between works and grace is fundamental, as it dismantles any notion of human boasting and points out the absolute confidence of humanity on God's gratuitous mercy. In this light, the election of the remnant magnifies the gracious aspect of God, who, in his sovereignty, chooses to save a people for himself, not based on their righteousness, but his mercy. The doctrine of the remnant, as enunciated by Paul, thus embodies a thorough tension within the economy of God's salvation history. On the one hand, it discloses the severity of God's judgment upon Israel for their unbelief and rebellion. 
On the other hand, it showcases the copiousness of God's grace in retaining a remnant for himself, thereby ensuring that his covenantal promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob would not ultimately fall to the ground. This tension between judgment and grace is not a contradiction, but a thinking of the extent of God's wisdom and the ramification of his dealings with his creation. Basically, Romans 11, 1, 6, is a dense theological passage that offers profound insight into the nature of divine election, the role of grace, and the faithfulness of God to his covenant people. Paul, through his discussion of the remnant, provides a foundation for ascertaining how God's sovereign intentions are being worked out in history, affirming that despite the appearance of rejection, God has not abandoned his people. This section tests believers to grapple with the sovereignty of God's grace and the mystery of his merciful election inviting them into a richer trust in the God who chooses, safeguards, and saves, according to the abundance of his grace. Furthermore, in the unraveling narration of Romans chapter 11, verses 7 through 10 pivot to a sobering contemplation of Israel's condition, a nation chosen, yet partially hardened. This passage dwells on a perplexing dichotomy within the divine economy, the simultaneous existence of election and hardening within the same covenant community, the Apostle Paul, with theological precision and pastoral sensitivity, traverses the treacherous waters of divine sovereignty and human responsibility, examining the theme of Israel's hardening as both a historical reality and a theological mystery. Paul's account begins with a stark contrast. While a remnant has been chosen by grace, the rest of Israel has been hardened. This hardening is not arbitrary, but presents a specific meaning within God's salvific plan. Paul elucidates this concept by drawing from the elegant dosser of Israel's scriptural heritage, citing passages from Deuteronomy, Isaiah, and the Psalms to delineate the scriptural antecedents of hardening. This scriptural mooring not only validates Paul's logic, but also demonstrates the continuity of God's actions throughout the history of salvation. The hardening of Israel, as presented by Paul, is a divine response to persistent unbelief and rebellion, Yet it is also a mechanism through which God advances his redemptive agenda, notably the inclusion of the Gentiles. The concept of hardening, as expressed by Paul, evokes a spectrum of theological and existential questions. On one hand, it reiterates the severity of God's judgment against unbelief, a theme that resonates with the Old Testament narratives of divine justice. On the other hand, it displays the mysterious intensity of God's sovereignty, wherein even the disobedience of his people is constructed into the fabric of a larger redemptive aim. Paul's discussion confronts the reader with the reality of God's inscrutable judgments and his unfathomable ways, inviting a posture of humility before the divine mysteries. The passage's theological depth is matched by its pastoral connotations. For the Roman community, comprising both Jewish and Gentile believers, the issue of Israel's hardening could potentially fracture the fragile unity of the nascent church. Paul addresses this sensitive issue not to foster division, but to cultivate a stronger comprehension of God's merciful providence. By repeating the hardening of Israel, Paul sets the arena for an extensive discussion on mercy, underlining that the hardening is partial and temporary, providing a salvific ambition that ultimately includes the restoration of Israel. This fine nature of Israel's hardening tries prevailing notions of divine favor and judgment. It reframes the account of salvation history, presenting it as a perplexing interaction of divine grace, human agency, and cosmic redemption. The hardening of Israel becomes a theological lens through which to view the paradoxes of faith and unbelief, judgment and mercy, exclusion and inclusion. Paul's probing of this theme goes beyond bare doctrinal essay, inviting the believer into a weighty involvement with the mysteries of divine will and human freedom. In addition, Paul's lecture on hardening extends an implicit invitation to self-examination for both Jewish and Gentile readers. For Jewish believers, it handles as a solemn reminder of the dangers of complacency and presumption upon heritage or works. For Gentile believers, it cautions against arrogance and promotes gratitude for their inclusion into the covenant community through grace. In this manner, the discussion of Israel's hardening becomes a catalyst for unity within the diverse body of Christ bound together by the common thread of divine mercy. To sum up, Romans 11, 7, 10, with its focus on the hardening of Israel, remains as a profound theological meditation on the nature of divine judgment and grace.
Through Paul's inspired pen, the passage confronts readers with the bottom of God's sovereignty and the unfathomable abundance of his salvific plan. It challenges prevailing assumptions about election and hardening, revealing a God whose judgments are righteous, whose ways are mysterious, and whose aspirations are redemptive. This research of hardening not only aggravates the believer's grasp of God's dealings with Israel, but also invites consideration on the nature of faith, the grace of inclusion, and the posture of humility before the divine mysteries. In the heiress of Romans, this passage is a central thread, composing together themes of judgment, mercy, and redemption in the impressive description of salvation history. Further, the passage of Romans chapter 11, verses 11 through 32, represents a theological crescendo within Paul's epistle, addressing the enigmatic coaction between the inclusion of the Gentiles and the future salvation of Israel. In these verses, Paul crafts an exact questioning that surpasses minor doctrinal analysis. It is a divine mystery disclosed, a detail of redemption that contains the entirety of humanity, Jew and Gentile alike. This segment of Paul's letter is not only climactic in following the Apostles' theology of salvation, but also central to grasping the universal scope of God's redemptive plan. Paul initiates this monologue with a rhetorical question, pondering whether Israel's stumbling indicates their ultimate fall. He emphatically rejects this notion, suggesting instead that through their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles. This strategic stumbling is represented not as an end, but as a means, a divine strategy to incite within Israel a holy jealousy and ultimately to aid their return. This paradigm of salvation, wherein the Gentiles' inclusion serves as a catalyst for Israel's redemption, underscores the convolution and extent of God's salvific directions. It cogitates a divine economy where judgment interlaces with mercy and exclusion paves the way for universal inclusion. The metaphor of the olive tree, introduced by Paul, further elucidates the relationship between Israel and the Gentiles. In this vivid imagery, the natural branches, Israel, and the wild olive shoots, Gentiles, share in the richness of the same base, symbolizing the shared blessings of Abraham's covenant. Yet, Paul warns the Gentile believers against arrogance, admonishing them of their dependent status and the possibility of being cut off for unbelief. Conversely, he speaks of the potential grafting in of the natural branches once more, should they not persist in unbelief. This metaphor not only depicts the unity and variety within God's family, but also aids as a poignant advice of God's sovereign grace and the mutable nature of human response to divine invitation. Central to this rhetoric is the declaration of a mystery, that a partial hardening has come upon Israel until the full number of the Gentiles has come in, leading to all Israel being saved. This statement, replete with eschatological gravity, emphasizes a future act of divine mercy, where Israel, in its entirety, will adopt the salvation afforded in Christ. This eschatological vision is neither a blanket endorsement of universalism, nor a simplistic resolution to the sophisticated history of Israel's unbelief. Rather, it is an affirmation of God's faithfulness to His covenant promises, a divine commitment that withstands the vicissitudes of human history and rebellion. Paul's contemplation on the mercy of God forms the theological zenith of this passage. The apostle contemplates the intensity of God's wisdom and knowledge, marveling at the manner in which God has bound all to disobedience, only to extend mercy to all. This divine dialectic, where judgment helps as the precursor to mercy, deliberates a theological perspective where the ultimate function of God's dealings with humanity is the manifestation of his mercy. Through Paul's comment, Mercy arrives as the defining trait of God's nature, the telos towards which all of God's actions are directed. The inclusion of the Gentiles and the future salvation of Israel, as uttered by Paul, invites readers into a contemplation of the vastness of God's salvation plan. It confronts entrenched notions of election and exclusion, presenting a vision of God's kingdom that is radically inclusive and universally merciful. This passage not only supplies as an essential for Christian theology, but also displays a paradigm for grasping the nature of the church, a community called to represent the same mercy and inclusivity that typifies God's actions towards humanity. In essence, Romans 11, 11, 32 rests as a colloquy to the bottom of God's mercy and the breadth of his redemptive plan. Through Paul's inspired commentary, 
readers are invited to marvel at the mystery of salvation, a divine narration that comprises both judgment and grace, exclusion and inclusion. This passage tests believers to re-envision their intuitiveness of God's goals for Israel and the Gentiles. Stimulating a posture of humility, gratitude, and hope in the face of God's unfathomable mercy. In the curtain of Paul's theological speech, these verses come up as a vibrant thread, accentuating the universal scope of God's grace and the abiding faithfulness of his covenant promises. Last but not least, in the culminating verses of Romans chapter 11, verses 33 through 36, the Apostle Paul transitions from theological treatise to doxological exaltation presenting a concluding doxology that is as vivid in its theological indications as it is majestic in its worshipful adoration. This section stays not simply as an epilogue to the reasons that precede it, but as a theological climax, epitomizing the awe and reverence that the mysteries of God's wisdom and knowledge encourage. Through this doxology, Paul sums up the heart of the Christian response to divine revelation, worship that flows from a deep recognition of God's inscrutable judgments and untraceable ways. Paul begins this doxology with an exclamation of wonder at the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, affirming the inexhaustible nature of God's attributes. This awe-inspired declaration meditates a thematic thread created throughout Romans, the unfathomable beauty of God's redemptive plan, distinguished by an entanglement that defies human understanding. In this context, Paul's doxology delivers as a thoughtful pause inviting the reader to marvel at the divine economy, where judgment and mercy, hardening and inclusion, work synergistically towards the fulfillment of God's salvific intents. The rhetorical questions that follow, who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor, assert the transcendence of God's wisdom above human wisdom. These questions are not posed to elicit answers, but to highlight the chasm between divine and human knowledge, they caution the readers of their finitude in the face of divine omniscience and sovereignty, boosting a posture of humility and reliance. This acknowledgement of God's incomprehensibility is not a call to intellectual resignation, but an invitation to worship, entrenched in the recognition of our limited capacity to grasp the fullness of divine wisdom. Besides, the doxology touches on the theme of divine provision and generosity. For from Him, and through Him, and to Him, are all things— this statement summarizes an inclusive view of reality, affirming God as the source, sustainer, and goal of all creation. It is a theological affirmation that all of existence is contingent upon God, meditating Paul's great conviction of God's sovereign lordship over the cosmos. This realization that all things find their origin and objective in God gives as a foundation for Paul's exhortation to live lives that are oriented towards God's glory, indicating the doxological nature of Christian existence. The concluding affirmation, To Him be glory forever, presents as the ultimate plan and goal of all theological inquiry and idea. Paul's doxology culminates in the subscription of glory to God, moving from the contemplation of divine mysteries to the proclamation of divine majesty. This shift from theology to doxology is emblematic of Paul's perception of the Christian life, one that is lived in constant acceptance of and response to the glory of God revealed in the gospel. The eternal ascription of glory to God abbreviates the significance of the Christian vocation, to bear witness to the glory of God in all aspects of life, grounded in the agreement of His grace, wisdom, and sovereignty. In summation, the concluding doxology of Romans chapter 11 exists as a serious confirmation to the extent of Paul's theological impression and his action to worship as the appropriate response to divine revelation. It abridges the central themes of the epistle— the sovereignty of God, the mystery of salvation, and the inclusivity of God's mercy, and redirects them towards their ultimate end, the glorification of God. This doxological conclusion provides not only as a fitting climax to the theological discourse of Romans 9, 11, but also as a model for Christian theology and praxis, wherein the pursuit of knowledge about God always culminates in the worship of God. Through this doxology, Paul invites believers into a space of wonder, humility, and praise, urging them to live in a manner that muses the glory of the God whose wisdom and ways are beyond tracing out. In conclusion, the sojourn through Romans chapter 11 culminates in a thorough appreciation for the intensity of God's wisdom and the breadth of his redemptive plan, 
as pronounced by the Apostle Paul. This scrutinization shows a drapery of divine sovereignty interwoven with human history, where the hardening of Israel and the inclusion of the Gentiles handle as crucial mechanisms in the embodying narrative of salvation. Through Paul's theological dialogue, we are invited into a space of contemplation that eclipses pure intellectual realization, urging us towards a posture of humility and awe in the face of divine mysteries. The concluding doxology not only serves as a climax to this theological search, but also condenses the aspect of the Christian response to God's revelation. A life of worship and doxology, oriented towards the glory of God. Additionally, this passage tries contemporary believers to ponder on the nature of God's mercy, the complexities of his salvific principles, and the call to materialize a community that reasons God's inclusive grace. It beckons us to connect with the theological tensions between judgment and grace, urging us towards a more profound faith that rests in the assurance of God's sovereign goodness and his unfailing promises. As we cruise the complications of faith, identification, and community within the contemporary church, Romans chapter 11 holds as a flare of theological depth and pastoral wisdom, guiding us towards a more weighty recognition of our place within God's redemptive story. In brief, Romans chapter 11 not only advances our theological senses, but also transforms our practical living, calling us to a life that glorifies God in all things. It is a chapter that bridges the bottoms of theological inquiry with the heights of doxological response, inviting us into a surviving adventure of faith, hope, and love within the great account of salvation history.